We're excited to have you all here. I have Dr. Katie Young with us again. You know, a couple months ago, we talked about feeding your horses in the off season. And now it's time to talk about, you know, spring tune-ups and stuff like that. The weather's starting to get a little bit nicer. And I know I'm excited to get going. So we're excited to have Dr. Katie Young here. Um, Dr. Young received her BS degree from Missouri State University in biology, minoring in animal science and chemistry and earned her PhD degree from Texas A&M University in equine nutrition and exercise physiology. Her graduate research focused on mineral balance in resting and exercising horses, and the effects of fat added diets on sweat production and electrolyte requirements in working horses. Dr. Young was a member of the TAMU equine science facility Oh, faculty for several years during and following her tenure as a graduate student. And since leaving academia, Dr. Young has spent more than 20 years in the equine industry as an equine nutritionist, horse feed program manager, and business consultant for farmland industries. And then as a technical equine nutritionist for purine animal nutrition. She's got extensive experience in horse feed formulation, quality control and production, customer service and communication, sales and sales training, marketing and regulatory and labeling requirements for equine feed. And she was, uh, she was highly involved in every aspect of production, product, product development and launches from ideation to formulation and production to packaging, design and marketing, sales training and distribution. Dr. Young is currently an equine nutritionist working with Kentucky Equine Research and is also providing nutrition consultations to veterinarians and horse owners. Um, Dr. Young's been a professional trainer and riding instructor for more than 40 years and continues to do so in the Kansas City area. She specialized in um, eventing and hunter jumpers. So with that, I'm super excited to have you with us, Dr. Katie Young. Um, I'll let you take it away and tell us what we need to know for to get ready for spring. Well, thank you, Hannah. And yes, like you, I'm very excited that Weather's warming up. Of course, now we've gone from the snow and ice season to the mud season, so that's always a great deal of fun. But in any case, it is spring, so it's time to get ready, set, and ride our horses. Uh, I'm going to go over a lot of different things today, and quite honestly, in putting this presentation together, I started kind of getting off in a ditch and might have gotten a little too far into uh, performance horse metabolism and fuel use, but Hopefully y'all will bear with me and um, again, just go through a lot of things to think about when it's time to start legging our horses up. So some of the spring health considerations, we'll talk about vaccinations, parasite prevention, hoof condition, general health, all the things when you're going, you're, you're starting to think about getting back into the show season, the competition season, or just working your horse harder. And so a lot of just basics to take care of before we start fitting those horses. So then we'll talk a little bit about conditioning programs and a gradual reintroduction to work. And of course, appropriate management and joint support for those horses as we're expecting them to work harder. And finally, we'll talk about the nutrition and management because some things as we go into spring, there are usually changes in the forage forages that the horses are eating. They're use often going from uh, primarily hay as their forage source to possibly, hopefully, green pasture. We want to make sure we minimize risk of digestive disturbances in making those changes. We also want to talk about some of the changes in nutrient requirements as the horses go back to work. So first things first, we want to make sure that our horses uh, have their health care taken care of in the spring. We often, that's the time we have the annual spring visit by our veterinarian and have our veterinarian take care of the vaccination. If this is time to get your horse's uh, Coggins updated, all the things you want to do and make sure you're ready for your competition season. As far as vaccines, of course, we, we usually use the core vaccines and then any specific vaccines for your region, your horse's risk, uh, your horse's age, all of these things, you want to make sure you work with your veterinarian and make sure your horse is protected as well as possible 
Uh, in the spring, we're looking at getting into the biting insect season, and a lot of these diseases can be transmitted by biting insects. So it's important to get your vaccinations up to date so your horse is you know, as protected as you can possibly make sure. And then also the parasite prevention, make sure you're working with your veterinarian to ensure that your horse uh, has got as good of a program for minimizing parasite load as possible. Now, I know what I do with my horses, but I never make those recommendations because it depends on what region you are in, what type of parasites you deal with. And of course, your, vac your veterinarian is the best resource to make sure that your horse is on the best parasite prevention program that it can be on. So some other things to think about with that spring health care, general health and soundness concerns. Uh, either yourself or with your veterinarian, you want to ev evaluate your horse's body condition score. And in the last webinar, we talked quite a bit about body condition scoring, and you can go back and review that, but it is an important system to be aware of and to, to understand so you can make sure that your horse maintains the appropriate body condition score. And of course, your veterinarian can also help you with that. You also want to make sure you work with your vet to look for any signs of discomfort, lameness, et cetera, because if you're looking at putting your horse into hard work, so you're going to start that fitness program. You want to make sure everything is taken care of before you start pushing them. And of course, again, work with your veterinarian to, to address any discomfort or lameness concerns and possibly look at appropriate supplementation. There are good supplements available for joint support, for gastric care, and some of them, of course, from Kentucky Equine Research that you can look at would be Total Wellness, KER Flex, or Synovate HA for the, the joint support. And then for digestive and gastric support, you could look at Equisure, Right Track, Triactin. They're all excellent sub, uh, supplements. And you can look on the KER website, which is just ker.com, and read through and see the difference in what each of those supplements does and has to offer for your horse. And of course, they are research backed. So they're great supplements for working horses. You may also want to work with your vet and your farrier and evaluate your horse's foot condition because a lot of times in the winter, we pull the shoes. If we give our horse a layoff, give them a break, we might want to pull our sho the shoes and let those feet kind of get a rest. So when you're looking to put the horse back in work, you want to have your farrier evaluate their feet. And some horses, some of my horses, I'm able to leave barefoot all the time, but some of them I can't. Some of them have to be shod to protect those feet and keep them in good condition. Again, we want to prepare before we get them, get them started on those conditioning programs and make sure that everything is set for success. So back to the body condition scoring, this is just a quick review. Um, you want to make sure you evaluate your horse's fat cover to, to ensure that they are the appropriate body weight and body condition. And for working horses, when we're looking at going into a fitness program, ideally we would like to have the horse at about a body condition score of a five. If they're much above a body condition score six, they're carrying a lot of fat, which is dead weight and it can if when you start working them and they need to sweat and dissipate heat it can impair their thermal regulation on the other hand if they're less than a body condition score maybe four and a half then we've got horses that don't have enough fuel to to ensure that they can work as hard as you may want them to work so for working horses generally i like to see about a four and a half to a five and a half just to make sure that there are They've got all the nutrients, all the fuels that they need to support, you know, a, a good work effort. Now, when we want to start conditioning our horses, I have to say I, I'm not the expert on conditioning programs for each specific type of activity, but there are plenty of experts out there. And these are just the little results when I Googled for spring conditioning for performance horses, and then I googled spring conditioning for barrel racing horses in particular. Look at all the different uh, websites you can go to and, and look at exactly how to set up your conditioning program. So 
I recommend that you Google what type of conditioning program you're interested in. And then some of the common points in these conditioning programs as I went through is you gotta evaluate your horse's starting point. Where is your horse today? Because as you went through the winter, some of us completely let our horses off. Some of us give them a break if you've had a really hard competition schedule in 2020, which you know some people actually were able to do that. Some people got stuck at home all year. But if your horse was working hard, you may have let them off completely, or you may have kept them working through the winter and just taken the fitness, fitness level down a bit. So those are things to evaluate when you start up in a new conditioning program. If your horse is current on all their health concerns, has man, maintained that level of fitness, a, a baseline through the winter, then bringing them back to a competition workload may take less time. However, if the horse has had a complete layoff and has really gotten out of shape, you've got to be very gradual, start them back very slowly and gradually bring them back to competition fitness. And pretty much everything I've read suggested starting out with a lot of walking, then maybe adding some hill work into that, doing a lot of suppling exercises, and then gradually increase the duration and the intensity of your workout. And depending on the level of fitness required, that conditioning process can be pretty lengthy. So depending on where your horse was over the winter, want to think about how quickly we need to get back into conditioning so they can get up to competition level and be ready to go when the show, show season starts. Dr. Young, I have a question. Yeah. So, you know, obviously it's not fun to have a fat horse when you're trying to, you know, run barrels or whatever you're doing, but what are some other, you know, benefits to having your horse in shape, you know, from a big layoff? Like what are some other benefits to having your horse in shape such as like, less injury or, you know, things like that? That is such a great question. If the horse is in shape, when you really start to push them for the, the competition, yes, there's less risk of injury. You've got to think about not just the, the body condition score and having them the right level of fatness, but you want to have those muscles fit. And think about it as humans. If, uh, if you want to start a running program, if you go out and run hard the first day, the second and third day, you're going to just be broken. And it can take quite a while. If you do that to your horse, it can take a while, quite a while for the horse to come back from the sore muscles, the possible uh, sore soft tissue, tendon ligaments, and you can do damage to their feet. There are all sorts of, of supporting structures that if you push too hard too fast, the horse is going to break down and then you've got recovery time, vet bills. And if it's, if it's a bad enough situation, that horse may never be able to get to the competition level again. So that's one of the reasons we want to go so slowly, so carefully and just gradually build back that fitness level. And of course you do want them fit enough that when you go to your competition, you want the horse to be competitive. Mm -hmm. Does that we will cover? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So as you're going through the conditioning program, you want to be able to monitor the fitness level and of course the soundness of the horse. Uh, but to monitor the fitness level, riders use several different uh, tools. One tool that's commonly used is just the horse's respiration, respiration rate, how quickly they breathe. Uh, However, that has been shown in research that the post-exercise respiratory rate is not really a reliable indicator of fitness. There's a lot of individual variability there. And it just, just because the, you see a change in respiration rate doesn't really tie hand in hand with how fit that horse is. Some, some people also use blood parameters. You see this a lot on the, the racetrack. Uh, Red blood cell count, hemoglobin concentration, packed cell volume, looking at resting values, and then values uh, when after like post exercise. Resting values are absolutely not reliable indicators of fitness. And uh, one of the reasons in the horse, the horse's blood system 
is, is different than humans. When, when a horse starts exercising and more oxygen is needed by the tissues, the spleen where red, red blood cells are stored, are manufactured and stored, the spleen in the horse actually contracts and releases a bunch is more of red blood cells into circulation. That doesn't happen in humans. So in a horse, if you start looking at something like the red blood cell count and the horse starts exercising and gets all this, the splenic contraction in this big dump of red blood cells, you can see why those blood parameters really may not be something you can use to monitor the horse's fitness. Now, heart rate is probably the best tool that you can use to monitor your horse's fitness level. You can look at the horse's resting heart rate, which in the horse 28 to 48 beats per, per minute is the typical normal resting heart rate. And you want to know your horse's resting heart rate as a benchmark for the assessment then of the recovery, heart rate recovery following a work bout. So following exercise, you want to see the horse's heart rate return to the normal resting rate within about 30 minutes. And that gives you an idea of how fit your horse is. If the horse's resting heart rate is slower to return to normal or quicker to return to normal, then you, that gives you an idea. The faster they return to normal, that means your horse is more fit. And one good tool to use for for calculating that or, or monitoring that would be, of course, a heart, an onboard heart rate monitor so that you can really uh, tell, even as the horse is exercising, you can tell what the horse's heart rate is. And you can also just use a stethoscope and uh, measure the resting heart rate. And then after you ride, you go back and use your stethoscope and measure it again. But again, the heart rate monitor just gives you real time heart rates. and uh, KER uh, has, has worked with several heart rate monitor suppliers and offers a heart rate monitor through the website, but the, it's really cool. And then, then KER has a clock it app on your phone. So you can actually have our heart rate monitor on your horse and be looking at your phone and say, oh, this is really cool. I'm seeing what my horse's heart rate is doing right this minute. Or if the heart rate monitor is on a horse that is working, you can be sitting in a comfortable chair in, in some shade, watching your phone and watching somebody else work your horse and looking at your horse's heart rate on your phone, which I think is a really cool way to you know, spend a hot day in the summer. But anyhow, so with a heart rate monitor, you keep your you want to keep the work within a horse's aerobic zone. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that aerobic means, but is about 60 to 70 percent of the maximal heart rate. And depending on your horse and your horse's age, the maximal heart rate is usually about 210 to 220 beats per minute. You don't usually want to run the horse that hard or work the horse that hard, but again, about 60 to 70 percent of your horses maximal heart rate. And there's a really good article on the KER website called Getting Your Horse in Shape that can help work you through that. And when we're talking about the 60 and 70 percent, is that like the whole workout basically minus warm up and cool down? Pretty much depending on what the, the goal is for your horse. It really depends on what you're conditioning your horse to do. There's going to be a difference, and again, this you can go into this as you uh, Google your conditioning programs. But horses, the the Western performance horses that are, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, primarily anaerobic work in competition versus something like an endurance horse that's primarily aer aerobic work over long periods of time. So you really want your conditioning program and the where you keep the heart rate in those in those workouts, you want that to support the competition that your horse is being conditioned for. For instance, I tend to be um, I, I when I compete, it's more in eventing and lower level eventing. So when I'm working my horse, I do a lot more low, long slow distance work because that's primarily where I'm going to be in competition. But if you're barrel racing, for instance, your horses are sprinting 
and that's more anaerobic work. So you're going to spend some time, not the whole workout by any means, but you're going to spend some time pushing some on that maximal heart rate because you want the horse conditioned to be able to perform that type of exercise in competition. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you. So now as we've kind of figured out what sort of conditioning program you want for your particular horse, you want to look at the changing nutrition needs. So as you go from the layoff in the winter to conditioning, working towards that competition season, of course, as the workload increases, the nutritional needs will change. The horse is going to have higher calorie requirements and then higher nutrient requirements as well, the protein, vitamins, and minerals. And you're also looking at that big possible change in forage. Uh, green pasture, turning horses out on green pasture can present challenges. I'm sure we've all heard of grass founder or pasture founder. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, because we want to mi minimize any risk of causing laminitis in our horses or uh, colic in our horses. But before that, we want to make sure, too, we determine what feeding program will be appropriate to support adequate body weight and condition as that workload, the fitness level, and the stress increases on our horses. So this is a slide I used before when we went from competition season into the winter. But now that we're going from the winter back into spring and working, uh, the slide is just reversed. So... If our horse has been laid off and been a maintenance horse, think about an 1,100 pound maintenance horse that's just hanging out doing nothing for a living. Uh, calorie requirements are 1665 kilocalories per day, and then 630 grams of crude protein, 27 grams of lysine, 20 grams of calcium, 14 grams of phosphorus per day. And then you take that seven, same 1,100 pound horse moving from maintenance into a moderate workload. And the calorie requirement has gone all the way up to 2330 kilocalories per day. The protein, lysine, calcium, and phosphorus requirements also increase, usually not as drastically though, as the uh, calorie requirement does. So the first thing we do is then make sure we feed to meet those calorie requirements. So we adjust the feed intake to make sure we're meeting all the nutrient requirements. And as the horse goes to work, usually we can we increase the size of the grain meals, or we can change to a more nutrient dense feed, a higher calorie feed, higher protein, other vitamins and minerals. And of course, we'll adjust the forage intake as needed, but we gotta be aware of those risks associated with changing from the dry forage, primarily hay, to green pasture as we go from the winter to the spring. So we all do know that lush green pasture can be risky for horses, but a lot of times people don't really understand why exactly. So why does fresh grass cause laminitis in horses? And when I say laminitis, it can also cause colic in horses. We've got to understand plants. So plants, grasses, whatever type of, of forage your horse is grazing on, Plants use sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide to synthesize sugars. If you think back to maybe junior high biology, you were probably taught this, the what? Photosynthesis. So the plants spend all day in the sunshine synthesizing sugars, and then they grow at night. And so during the night, the sugars are what the plants use to fuel their growth. Now, when we get into problem, is that growth is more temperature sensitive than photosynthesis. So during the times when it's warm sunny days and chilly nights, the plants photosynthesize all day, make all their sugars, and at night it might be too cold for the plant to use the sugar to grow. So instead of growing and using up their sugars, they store the sugars and then the next day it may be sunny and warm again. And so it makes more sugars and more sugars. And then if it's cold at night, it's going to store more sugars and store and store and store. And the sugars are stored as starch in some plants and as fructans in other plants. And the warm season grasses mostly store starch, which they don't store as many sugars as starch. But the cool season grass that can store their sugars as fructans 
they can store a lot of sugar. So there can be a lot of fructans in these cool season grasses. The problem then, especially with the fructans, is when a horse then goes out and grazes on these grasses and plants that have very high levels of the soluble carbs or the fructans, you can get, especially the fructans, those fructans can travel into the horse's hindgut with the microbes. And it's, I'm sure y'all have heard of a grain overload causing um, colic and possibly laminitis. It can be a very similar thing with these fructans. The fructans are not digested and the sugars absorbed in the horse's upper gut. They travel onto the hindgut and it can wreak havoc with those microbes. And then that is how we can get uh, colic and possibly laminitis with the fructan or even the starch overload with fresh green grass. So some of the other things that also can affect the uh, starch and fructan load of the plants is when they're stressed, uh, the duration and intensity of sunlight, the salinity or salt content of the soil and the overall health of the plant, because there are times we think that the pasture should be really safe for the horses as far as starches and sugars, but in reality, the plants are, st are stressed and they are storing the sugars and not being able to grow. So we just have to be aware of that when we put our horses out on pasture. So how do we minimize uh, the, the risk of laminitis and, and colic in our horses when they go out onto fresh green pasture? Well, first off, if the horses are out on pasture year round, Mother Nature does a pretty good job of gradually uh, changing the pasture so the horse's gut has a chance to gradually adjust to the difference in the dry winter pasture versus the incoming green grass. Problems most likely occur when fresh forage is introduced, introduced abruptly. In a lot of situations, the horses have been in stalls, turned out, uh, and on hay all winter. And then when the spring grass starts coming up, you wanna keep the horses in and let the grass grow and get really solid before you let the horses go out and you know, kind of destroy the pastures. And those are the times you really have to be careful. So if the grass is already lush and horses are now getting turned out for the first time, be very careful how you do that. So some of the risk management options would be to feed hay immediately before turnout. So maybe the horse has uh, got some of the appetite already staved off and when they go out to the grass, they're not gonna just mow it down because they're already a little bit full. When you first start turning them out, it's good to restrict the grazing time. One suggested schedule is when you first turn them out on green grass, 30 minutes at a time, once or twice a day, just put the horses out, let them go for about 30 minutes, bring them back in, and then each day increase that time by five to 10 minutes until once the horse is out, they're grazing four to six hours at a stretch, then they're adjusted to the green grass. For very, very risk sensitive horses, the best time for grazing is when the plants are lowest in their uh, sugars, starch, fructans, which would be when they're they've already had a chance in the night to grow as much as they're, they're really gonna grow, use up their sugars. And so that's about 3 a.m. till 10 a.m. So the safest time as far as sugars and starch would be you know, when we're in sound sleep. <laughs> get up and go turn your horses out at 3 a.m. But that's something when you're first starting to get them used to the pasture again, maybe just uh, grazing first thing in the morning. And then of course, some of these horses, a grazing muzzle is really important to minimize their uh, grazing intake at all times if they're really sensitive to soluble carbohydrates. And then one last tip, uh, hindgut acidosis, all this with the, the sugar, the starch fructans into the hindgut, that can cause hindgut acidosis or a, a, a higher acid uh, level in the horse's hindgut. And you can see on this chart, uh, it, it just shows how the, the acid content of the hindgut when the horses are first put out on green pasture. And the bottom line on the graph shows that the supplement Equisure from KER 
really helps buffer that ass and stabilize the hindgut to help reduce the risk of acidosis. So Equisure may be a really good tool to use when you're starting to turn your horses out in pasture or anytime when the horses are going back and forth. Um, it's an it's a excellent hindgut, hindgut stability uh, supplement to use for your horses. So primary dietary goals for fitting your horse, getting your horse re ready for competition, and then competing your horse. We want to provide calories and nutrients to maintain condition repl and replenish the energy reserves in the muscles. The horses always use fuel that's stored in their muscle. So one of the big roles of the feed program for competition horses is to provide substrate to replenish those energy stores. We also wanna support tissue growth, adaptation and repair as the horse is being conditioned and through the, the work of competition. We also wanna optimize the fuel use during exercise. And of course, as always when we're feeding horses, we wanna use sound feeding management, support the healthy GI tract and minimize risks of digestive disturbances. So first we're gonna talk about calories and quite honestly in this presentation, I'm gonna focus more on calories or energy than on the other nutrients because for working horses, uh, the nutrient requirement that can be the hardest to actually meet and meet safely is their calorie requirement because a very hard working horse can require up to twice or sometimes even more than twice the calories of a horse at maintenance. We've got to be sure that we get those calories into those horses to make sure they have all the, the fuel they need, as well as the calories to support normal maintenance activities. So first, calories equal energy or fuel. Calorie is actually the unit of measurement for energy. So when people talk about energy as far as nutrition, we're not necessarily talking about your horse being hot or high. We're just talking about the horse getting adequate calories. And the best tool to measure if your horse is getting adequate calories to support maintenance as well as workload is again, body condition scoring. If the horse is getting too many calories, they're gonna get fat. If the horse is not getting, not getting enough calories, they're gonna be too thin. So I love body condition scoring because it's just really not rocket science. And it's pretty darn easy to figure out if your horse is getting the right, right number of calories. There are three sources of energy for horses. And remember, energy is calories. So the calories are coming from three nutrients. They're coming from carbohydrates, which are carbohydrates include the structural carbs or fibers and also the non-structural carbs, which would be the starch and sugars. Calories also come from fats and calories can come from protein. I will, I'm not gonna spend any time talking about protein as a calorie source because protein is a very inefficient calorie, calorie source. We want protein to be used, dietary protein should be supplying the amino acids for muscles, for blood, for bone, for growth, for work. We don't want protein to be supplying calories. And actually the process of converting protein to calories requires even more calories. So it's very inefficient. We want to provide calories as carbohydrates and fats to meet those horses' caloric needs. There, for, to meet the calorie requirements and to provide the right type of fuel for your horse's workload, we need to understand the two classifications of exercise because the two types of exercise utilize different fuel sources. So there is aerobic exercise and anaerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise is basically long, slow distance work. It's low to moderate intensity, and the fuel source for aerobic exercise is primarily fat. Anaerobic exercise, on the other hand, is maximal intensity, short duration. I think of it as kind of short blasts of power and or speed. The fuel source for anaerobic exercise is primarily primarily glycogen. And glycogen, which I haven't mentioned before, but glycogen is a polysaccharide. It's made of glucose or sugar molecules. And that is a polysaccharide that is stored in the muscle and used as fuel. Now the sugars to build glycogen come 
from the dietary non-structural carbohydrates or the starches and sugars in your horse's diet. So these days, a lot of people are very scared of starches and sugars in their horse's diet. You read and you see all the things about how NSC or soluble carbs or starch and sugar are just evil and bad for horses. But in reality, they're essential for horses, especially horses that are working anaerobically. They need the starch and sugar in their diet to make sure that they have adequate substrate to rebuild that glycogen when the, your horse uses the glycogen for the anaerobic activity. So fuel use during exercise, the work duration and intensity dictate the type of fuel that's primarily used for that workout. In aerobic mactism, sorry, aerobic metabolism, the, the process of metabolism is slower for aerobic versus anaerobic. It's a slower process, but it's very efficient. When the horse is burning fat for aerobic metabolism, or when the horse is burning a, a soluble carb, such as glycogen, aerobically, it's very efficient. The fuels, again, for the aerobic me metabolism is primarily fat, and then also glycogen and possibly glucose. And the activities that are primarily aerobic would be walking, a jog or a trot, and then a lope or a canter. So again, uh, low to moderate activity, but this activity can go on for a very, very long time. On the other hand, anaerobic metabolism is a very fast process, but it's also very inefficient, and the horse can run out of fuel. So the fuel for anaerobic metabolism would be glycogen and glucose. And there's a limited amount of glycogen stored in the muscles. So again, your horse, if you're pushing them in anaerobic metabolism for a very long time, they're flat going to run out of fuel and they're just not going to be able to go anymore. And in that sort of situation, you could even run into problems with their muscles tying up just because they're running out of fuel. That the, the exercises that would be considered anaerobic then would be sprints, the Western performance events, such as barrel racing, roping, et cetera. Show jumping is an anaerobic activity. Again, short blasts of power and speed are, tend to be anaerobically fueled. After saying all these things, I also wanna point out though that in any activity, it's never completely one fuel source or the other fuel source. All fuel, fuel sources are pulled on to some extent. So if you look at the endurance horse, you're looking at primarily fat as a fuel when that fat is available, but there is still, as, as you see on the, the red part of the bar, there's still a substantial amount of glycogen that is being burned for, by, during the endurance event. For a racehorse, it's much more glycogen because it's much more of an anaerobic activity, but there is still some aerobic met metabolism going on. But you can see the, the yellow, the fat fuel, is a much lower percentage of the total fuel used. And in a Western performance horse, it's almost all glycogen and just a very small amount of fat. But as you can see, again, it's never all one or another. I will point out with the, even the Western performance horses, when you are barrel racing, you're not running your horse hard all the time. There is also a lot of loping, there's a lot of conditioning. So there's a lot of aerobic activity going on as well. So even though the horse is a Western performance type of horse, you still have to feed them to supply fuel for all of the different types of workloads that you're expecting the horse to exhibit. And along those lines, Dr. Young, you would probably change what you're feeding or the amounts of what you're feeding based on, you know, if you're working or maybe if you're at like a weekend competition where they're, you know, running two or three times in a weekend, would you say that's, you would probably you, change it up? You may. Maybe? You may, but then again, you also want to be careful that you don't make big changes to your horse's right. diet. So the trick is to find the, the, the total ration that will supply fuel and fit your horse 
for all the different activities. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But one of the big things, though, is if the horse is, if you're feeding the horse for a high level of activity, and then for one reason or another, they take a break, that's when you want to be sure that you cut back on what they're feeding. Back uh, years and years ago, uh, tying up was actually called Monday morning disease because you had horses, and these were working horses, you know, ran, uh, when horses were used for plowing and, and, and working, they, they were our primary, uh, we didn't have cars. So, so our horses were our work animals. And that's when you saw the Monday morning disease because they would work hard all week and then they may not be working over the weekend and their feed was, they were fed as if they were still working. And then they were getting large. And of course, at that time, they were primarily being fed straight grains and so grains have a whole lot of sugar and starch, especially starch. And so in over the weekend, they were getting a lot of starch in their diet. They were not working and using that fuel. So on Monday, they'd come back to work and they'd tie up. So again, when the horse is not working, you want to address their diet, even if it's for a short term, maybe not take the feed completely away, but maybe back off the, on the feed. If the horse is hurt and laid up, that may be a time you want to back off on the feed and reevaluate their diet. But we want to figure out a good diet that will maintain the horse and provide the fuel throughout all the different types of activities. Perfect. It's definitely, it sounds like a balancing act for sure to make sure that you can get all the right stuff for what you're doing. <laughs> it absolutely is. And then as we go along, for those of you that are watching, if you have questions or, you know, want clarification on something, feel free to comment as we're going along and we'll make sure that we get you, you know, taken care of and answer your questions. Absolutely. Okay, so looking at the different types of uh, diets, the different type of, of ingredients that supply these fuels, first we want to talk about carbohydrates. So carbs as fuels. As I mentioned before, two types of carbohydrates, we have the non-structural carbohydrates, which are the starches and sugars, and then we have the structural or fiber carbs. So first, the non-structural carbs, the primary dietary source of non-structural carbs is grains. The typical grains, corn, oats, uh, we see a lot of wheat byproducts in, in horse feeds, sometimes milo, sometimes barley, but those grains contain, contain fairly large amounts of starch. Corn is about 70% starch. Oats, about 50% starch. Barley is kind of right in the middle between corn and oats. You always have to remember that the starch and sugars are what are primarily providing glucose for immediate fuel. And also that glucose is a substrate for glycogen synthesis. And if you're not aware, glucose is just a simple sugar that is there are a lot of different sugars, but glucose is the primary dietary sugar that is used in the body. The starch and sugars also, uh, well, as I said, they're the substrate for glycogen, and glycogen is the main fuel for anaerobic work. Non-structural carbs are highly digestible. They also can cause digestive disturbances if overfed, so you want to make sure you don't feed a large amount of soluble carbs or NSC in one meal, but if they're spread through the day or the meals are an appropriate size for the horse, then you don't overload the upper gut. You want the starch and sugar uh, digested and absorbed in the upper gut. And the problems occur when you, there's so much in one meal that it overflows the upper gut and gets into the hind gut and then causes acidosis and wreaks havoc with the microbes. And that's when you really run into problems. The other thing with the non-structural carbs in the meal, you do see an elevated plasma glucose and insulin response post meal. So we don't wanna see a huge glucose insulin response post meal, but it's just normal to see that response. And for a normal healthy horse, it's not an issue. There are some horses that uh, have insulin dysregulation for one reason or another. And for those horses, they're sensitive to soluble carbs. So we have to be careful with that. But the majority of horses are normal, healthy, 
And you don't have to be afraid of non-structural carbs in your horse's diet. And again, some soluble carbs are essential in the diet for the horse to be able to work. Now there is a theory that too much non-structural carb, too much starch and sugar can make a horse high or hot. That, that theory, there's not a lot of good research proof for that theory. However, if you have a horse that seems to be more animated, a little hotter than you want, you can look at the level of soluble carbs in your horse's diet and figure out what is the, the, what's the right level to make sure that the horse has right fuel for his workload, but also has a manageable attitude that you can handle. I personally have to say that the best thing for, for me to have a horse not be too hot, not be too high, is to ride him regularly and get plenty of turnout. And then the horses tend not to buck me off when I get right on them. So just some uh, thoughts from a horse person of many, many years who's ridden a lot of hot horses. And as we're talking about carbohydrates, I know we um, spoke about it, you know, just a minute ago about, you know, tying up and stuff like that. Um, it seems to be, you know, super prevalent, or maybe people are just talking about it more or whatever. Um, but what would you, I guess, we don't want to feed as much carbohydrates, but they still need carbohydrates. So how would you deal with that? Or do you substitute other things for those horses in place of carbohydrates? Or what are your thoughts on that? Oh, Hannah, we got another hour to talk there. <laughs> so, I'll tell you, I've, I really have gotten interested in the muscle myopathies, all the different types of tying up. And uh, Dr. Stephanie Valberg up at uh, Minnesota is doing a lot of research on muscle myopathies. And she's really done the genetic work on polysaccharide storage myopathy. And she is finding and identifying new muscle myopathies every day. And tying up is just a, a symptom. It's a broad term for what happens when the horse is exhibiting an episode of one of these muscle myopathies. So there's recurrent exertional rhabdomyolysis. There is polysaccharide storage myopathy type one and two. There's a malignant hyperthermia. Now there is myofibrillar meiosis. So there are all sorts of different muscle myopathies and they actually require different uh, dietary management strategies. So again, that is a whole different conversation. So we might have to do another webinar one of these days and really get into muscle myopathies. Yeah. But the first thing, if you have a horse that has problems with tying up, work with your veterinarian and uh, get a diagnosis if possible on what type of tying up, what's causing the episodes. Um, HYPP also, uh, the, an HYPP episode really looks very much like tying up. It's a very similar sort of situation. So figure out with your vet what's causing it. And then HYPP is, is related to the potassium in the diet. Uh, PSSM type one, we want to lower the soluble carbs and possibly increase the fat in the diet. Uh, the my, PSSM type two or uh, myofibrillar meiosis, on that, the soluble carb content is not near, we want a moderate, it's not as big of a deal. We don't want as, want, as, as high of a fat content and we really wanna look at the amino acid content of that diet. So it really, it just depends on the type for your horse, but and that's something, ker.com, we are more than happy to help you figure out some of those things with your horses. Okay, so it sounds like the most important thing is to figure out what's causing that yeah. issue, and then you can kind of go and structure a nutrition program based on what you're really dealing with. Exactly. And then, of course, there are some, some horses that tie up, and it's really back to the old... Um, Monday morning disease, in which case is a lot of times that's just a horse that's been laid off and brought, been brought to work, been brought back to work too quickly, and their muscles just get very sore. We see we see tying up in humans a lot of times on January second or third, after that New Year's resolution. This is the year I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get fit. January 1st, the gyms are full. And January 2nd, everybody's home saying, oh my Lord, I hurt so bad. 
So that could be happening to your horse as well. And that you don't have to uh, adjust with diet. That's just letting the horse have a rest and then bringing them back to work more gradually. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. And back, back to carbohydrates. Now let's talk about the structural carbohydrates or the fibers. The primary, ter- primary dietary source of the fibers is, of course, the forages, the hay, the pasture, the plants, and the horse's diet. And that should be the base of your horse's ration. You got to keep in mind the digestibility of various fibers is, is highly variable. Some fibers are very digestible or fermentable. And some are very, are either slowly fermentable, some are not even digested at all in the horse's gut. The fibers, the microbes in the horse's hindgut ferment the fibers. That's where the digestion of fibers primarily takes place in the hindgut. And the, the, fib, the fiber is broken down into volatile fatty acids, which are absorbed in the hindgut. They're used as a main calorie source for maintenance activity. The fiber is also necessary for normal hindgut function to keep your horse's hindgut happy, healthy, and the the poop moving through normally. That is all related to the fiber in the diet. Again, it's the primary fuel for maintenance activity. There are a lot of horses that can maintain appropriate weight and body condition on good quality forage alone as long as they're not working hard because the calories from the volatile fatty acids or VFAs, the horse can't get enough calories or fuel from VFAs to support maximal workloads. Plus, VFAs are not good for refilling the glycogen fuel stored in the muscles. There are a few volatile fatty acids that can be synthesized into glucose, but it's a very slow process. It's a not terribly efficient process. And so really hardworking horses just can't get enough calories that way. Now, fat as a fuel. Fat is a great fuel. It provides lots of calories. There's more than twice the calories per pound in fat than in either carbohydrates uh, or protein. A lot of the fats are very palatable. Some are not as palatable, but they're all good calorie sources. Fats also supply essential fatty fatty acids to support the horse's hair coat and skin condition. And a lot of times people see when they add a little fat to the horse's diet, the the hair coat really gets shiny and nice. And that's from the essential fatty acids. Fat is the primary energy source for aerobic metabolism. So for horses that are worked hard aerobically, it's good to have some additional fat in the diet. There's a little bit of, of natural fat in forages and grains, but for really hardworking, aerobically exercising horses, added fat in the diet is is a very good fuel source. When you do add fat to the diet, it does take some time for the body to efficiently learn to use that dietary fat as a fuel source. So you, you can't just start adding soy oil, for instance, to your horse's diet and immediately see the, uh, the benefits as the soy oil as a fuel. You'll see the calorie benefits immediately, but for the muscle fibers to be able to use the fat as a fuel, it takes about three weeks. Some of the uh, benefits you will see though, with fat as a fuel, the horse can exhibit increased stamina. It can exhibit a glycogen sparing effect because if the fat is available, the horse will use the fat for aerobic activity before the glycogen, thereby saving the glycogen for when it really needs it, when it needs to blast into exercise. And you see that even with Western performance horses that primarily compete with anaerobic activity, all the aerobic activity, when the horse has fat to use as a fuel, it can save the glycogen for when you go into the arena and run. And I don't know how many times I've heard somebody say, oh man, I left my best run out in the warm-up pen. Well, if the horse didn't have fat available as a fuel, it may have been using its glycogen when it was loping around the warm-up pen. And then when you go for your run, it's run out of glycogen. It says, I just can't run as hard as possible. So that's one of the benefits of some fat in the horse's diet. Yeah, the, the issue too, though, you got to remember, fat cannot be used as a substrate for glycogen synthesis. 
So fat in itself won't, won't refuel the glycogen tank. So when your horse runs and uses the glycogen, it's still primarily the soluble carbs, the NSC in the diet that will provide the glucose to refuel the glycogen. Other nutrient requirements, the horses, working horses do need more protein, more vitamins and minerals than maintenance horses. However, usually just increasing the feed uh, since a horse eats more feed to meet the calorie requirements by just increasing the total volume of feed and forage, it's gonna get more protein, more vitamins, more minerals in pounds per day. So you may not need to increase the percentage of protein vitamins in, in your feed. Just as you increase the feed, they're getting more to meet their requirements. But of course, a ration evaluation will help kind of determine to make sure that you know the horse is getting what they need. Some possible exceptions, even with the increased feed, the horses probably, when they start really working hard, they're not gonna be getting adequate salt or electrolytes from their forages and their feed. So that's a supplement that anytime a horse is working hard enough to sweat, they, they do need some salt electrolytes in their diet. And even maintenance horses, it doesn't hurt to have some salt or electrolytes available. And of course, there's some excellent KER electrolyte supplements, including the Restore SR and Race Recovery. The other, the other possibility when the horse is exercising, there is oxidative damage that takes place in their muscles. So antioxidant supplements can help reduce risk of muscle injury and help your horse be able to continue working as long and as hard as possible. And so vitamin E and CoQ10 uh, are, are both good antioxidants to use as supplements. So KER Nano E and uh, Nano Q10 are available through the KER website or at some of your feed dealers. So how do you choose the right feed for your horse? You wanna look for a feed designed with fuel sources to meet your horse's needs. And Hannah, that, that addresses to some extent what you are asking. So look at what your horse is doing for a living and choose a feed that's gonna meet, provide the substrates for the fuel that is used. For instance, if your horse is primarily doing anaerobic work, you might wanna look for a feed that has a higher NSC content grain-based ingredients. A lot of barrel racing horses are on uh, traditional sweet feeds, which are basically oats, corn, some molasses to make them really palatable. And then a lot of times a pellet that's got the protein, vitamins, and minerals. So it mixes nicely in with the grains. Absolutely nothing wrong with those. A lot of times people get very uh, worried about the total non-structural carbohydrate content of those sweet feeds. I will tell you a commercially prepared sweet feed uh, is, is not as high in NSC as people usually think. For, as I said, corn is about 70%, starch and sugars, oats about 50%. Uh, commercially prepared sweet feeds are usually gonna run uh, 30 to maybe at most 45% starch and sugars. So for a healthy working horse, that level of, of soluble carbs in their diet really is very rarely an issue. And you think about it, hard working horses, you often don't see these problems with laminitis and colic that you see in more sedentary and often slightly overweight horses. For aerobic working horses, then you can really look more at the higher fat and fiber ingredients because fat and fiber are really good aerobic energy sources and a, a more moderate NSC. There has been research that has shown now that if you get the soluble carb intake of a horse low enough that they can't even refill their glycogen fuel tanks, their work efforts can be impaired. So I think this is a pendulum that kind of swings and we've seen it swing in humans that we get really high sugar starch then we go really low sugar starch and the place to really be for most horses is in the middle, good moderate load. So you get, so the horse gets all the fuel substrates that they need for work. And then of course, you're looking for a calorie level to fit your individual horse. If your horse is a hard keeper, you might want a higher calorie level, a really easy keeper, 
maybe a little bit lower calorie level. And as work and fitness level increase, you're gonna look at increasing the amount of the daily ration to meet the calorie and other nutrient requirements, possibly choosing a higher calorie dense feed and make sure your forage is good to excellent quality because the higher the quality of the forage, the more calories and other nutrients that forage provides for your horse. Now, what happens if your horse is a really easy keeper? I've, if you've got a horse, even sometimes a hardworking horse can basically maintain appropriate body weight and condition on forage and really doesn't need a lot of extra calories for feed. Now, uh, if your horse is a really hardworking horse, they're gonna need some more calories. But if it's a moderate working horse, I gotta say a little halflinger in this, in this picture, even at moderate work, this little dude didn't need, he's, he's as fat as he is, just on a round bale, and he was wearing a grazing muzzle with a round bale, and he is still that fat, and he was in regular work. So for something like that, a ration balancing feed, uh, the KER all phase pellet, concentrated protein, vitamins, and minerals in a pellet, so you can feed a really small amount for a, a typical horse, one to two pounds a day, gets them all the nutrients they need without a lot of calories, or if you've got a horse that really even needs less than that, a vitamin mineral supplement such as KER Micromax, just to make sure that they get, there are some, there's some minerals missing in pretty much all forages and in hay, the vitamin E and vitamin A activity in hay drops dramatically after even like three months. So the, a, a vitamin mineral supplement just to make sure the horse is getting all the things that they need to support work, growth, you know, normal maintenance and have healthy horses. And of course, this is another one. A grazing muzzle is a really good route to go with, with these uh, horses that really want to be overweight. And finally, it's just some feeding management because as we feed our horses, we want to make sure we keep their gut healthy and minimize the risks of any digestive disturbances or problems that we could have just by feeding. So the first thing is feed horses by class, which you feed your horse according to what your horse does for a living. If you've got a maintenance horse that doesn't need a lot, don't feed them like they're a Kentucky Derby racehorse. If you've got a racehorse or a, a performance horse, don't feed them like a maintenance horse. Make sure you're feeding them according to what they, they do and, and their nutrient requirements. You also wanna feed according to body weight to maintain appropriate body condition. So you're gonna feed a 1200 pound thoroughbred differently than that little halflinger in the last slide. So feed according to your own horse and your own horse's needs. You also want to feed adequate forage or roughage. The minimum is 1% of the horse's body weight per day. So a thousand pound horse needs a minimum of 10 pounds of uh, forage per day, and that's on a dry matter basis. So hay is primarily dry matter. A thousand pound horse needs at least 10 pounds a day of hay just to maintain health, uh, gut health. And most horses get more than that. 2% of their body weight per day in forage is really usually not a problem. And if you're looking at like a lactating broodmare, she may even get up to 3% of her body weight per day in forage. And the, the grass is very high in water content. So by weight, it may be three times by weight as much fresh pasture as it is hay. So just kind of keep in mind, got to make sure you have a good base of forage for that diet. Measuring feed and hay by weight and not volume is, is a very, very common uh, mistake that horse owners make. A, a scoop of feed, a scoop of oats is not the same as a scoop of corn, is not the same as a scoop of pellets because they are all different densities. So make sure you weigh your scoop of feed and also make sure you weigh your hay. You really can't weigh your pasture, but you want to know how much you're feeding your horse by weight and not by volume. I talked about the grain or soluble carbohydrate overload to the hindgut. And that relates back to this next management tip of a maximum of 0.5% grain in one meal. And that's 0.5% of the horse's body weight or 
half a pound per hundred pounds of body weight. That is so that you don't get so much grain in a meal that it overloads the horse's upper gut and gets into the hind gut where that excess sugar and starch can cause problems with the microbes. That is affected by the soluble carb content of the meal. If you're feeding straight corn, you actually, I don't know that I'd, I'd probably say 0.3 pounds per 100 pounds of body weight. If you're feeding a feed that is low in sugar and starch, you can feed more in a meal. So that's kind of the, uh, just kind of a general purpose rule that can be adjusted depending on what actually is in that horse's meal. You also want to feed small amounts often. If you think about how the horse's digestive system was designed, horses in nature eat little bits of forage almost all day long. So there's small amounts of feed going through the gut all the time. When you feed a horse that way, digestion and absorption is very efficient and you rarely run the risk of digestive disturbances. But of course, in our real world, our horses tend to get two meals a day. We want to just as much as we can mimic mother nature. So if the horse is needing a lot of grain to support its workload, for instance, or lactating there, it's best to divide that amount of, of feed into more meals. So if you have to get more than that half a pound per 100 pounds of body weight in a meal, then maybe add more meals to the day and ideally spread evenly through the day. So we, again, are trying to, uh, we're trying to mimic mother nature as much as possible with feed going through the, the gut all the time. And finally, we want, to, we want to avoid abrupt ration changes. Cold turkey changes wreak havoc on the horse's gut. And that's a cold turkey change in grain, of course. Most horse people are aware of that, but it also means uh, the forage. So cold turkey change of uh, green grass to hay or hay to green grass, or even from one quality of hay to a different quality of hay, all of those big changes should be made gradually. A small change can be made over just three to four days. A big change may, may warrant a gradual uh, 10 day to two week change. So make your changes gradually to minimize disruption to your horse's gut. So take home messages. Remember spring health considerations, work with your veterinarian, uh, get that vet check, make sure your horse is up to date on vaccinations and parasite prevention. Then take a look at your conditioning program, figure out what program is going to work best for your horse and your horse's type of workload and gradually redu reintroduce them to that workload along with appropriate management and joint support to make sure your horse is healthy and sound to be able to compete at the workload. And finally, nutrition and management, changes in forages, minimize risk of dis digestive disturbances, adjust the rations for changes in nutrient requirements as your horse goes back to work and feed to meet nutritional requirements and maintain the healthy digestive tract. And with that, hopefully we're ready to ride our horses. And the last take home message, wanted to let you know that KER's March promotion, the joint health products are 15% off. So you can go to the KER website, you can use the code JOINT321. And thank you very much for your time. And if, you're, if there are any more questions, I am more than happy to answer. Yeah, so I wanna give our viewers a couple minutes to comment with any questions, but I do have um, a couple that have come to me. Um, so when would I need to add electrolytes to my feeding program? Do I wait until the weather gets hot or should I go ahead and start, you know, as soon as I step up work or, you know, should I have them on it constantly or when we're on the road or what's the best practice for electrolytes? That is a great question. And I will say I did, I did my graduate research. One of my projects was on electrolytes in horses. So absolutely. When your horse is exercising hard enough to sweat, you want to be sure they're getting electrolytes in their diet. Definitely want uh, the salt, we want sodium, potassium, possibly chloride. 
when you're competing a good electrolyte supplement, you want to you want to start them as you're increasing that workload that as you're conditioning them, you want to get them so that by the time they're up to their their optimal fitness, at that point, they should pretty well be on an electrolyte supplement, or at least you want to have free choice salt available. And quite honestly, I would have free choice salt available even for all horses, even when they're just out at maintenance. In my research, the horses that were at maintenance were in electrolyte balance. The sodium, potassium, and chloride in their diets were in balance without any additional salt. But I have got to say, I was in South Central Texas at Texas A&M, and the water available to drink in Bryan College Station, Texas, I actually researched this, and if you got no other sodium in your diet but drank tap water, you had too much sodium in your diet. So I can't say that that is the case in the rest of the country. And there are many places that sodium content, for instance, in forages is highly variable. So having salt available, free choice to your horses is very rarely a problem. If you have a horse that stands there and eats the salt block, that's called psychogenic salt consumption disorder. And in that case, I would not have free choice salt, but I might add some salt to their feed to make sure that they are are getting the feed. Uh, there are some good articles on proper use of electrolytes and when to bring them into the diet and how to manage them in the diet. But uh, again, for hardworking, sweating horses, electrolytes in the diet is, is a very, very important thing. Okay, awesome. And then someone else question, had a question that says, you know, my horse has a hay belly and needs to lose some weight coming out of winter, of course. And I noticed that if I limit his feed too much, he loses energy to run. So how can we work on, you know, bringing his body condition score down while still giving him enough energy to work and compete? That is another great question. Uh, first, I want to address the hay belly because uh, the hay belly is not showing the horse is fat. Now, that's not to say that your horse with a hay belly is not fat. It's just that there are horses that have a body condition score of less than five, but still have a big hay belly or a big grass belly, or sometimes a mare, a big pregnancy belly. So don't let the belly alone uh, dictate whether you think the horse is fat. Make sure you look over the top of the horse, feel them over the crest of the neck, over their ribs, um, all the places you look for body condition score. But as the horse loses weight, the hay belly is often just because it's got a, a gut, a hind gut full of fiber. So if they've been out on a, a pasture, especially winter pasture, the, the dry grass, uh, possibly a round bale, they can get a lot of, of, of just hind gut fiber that makes their belly big. As, as you start exercising them and bringing them back into fitness, a lot of times that resolves. But sometimes horses that don't, as, especially if you're seeing that the horse is has not got the energy to run as you're adjusting their diet, sometimes you need to look at the ratio of grain to hay. Because as I mentioned, the 1% of their body weight is the minimum hay to keep a good healthy diet in the horse. But weigh how much hay you're feeding your horse because a lot of horses, I know mine are getting 1.5 to 2% of their body weight in hay. And if they're not working hard, moving that fiber through, that can be enough right there to cause a hay belly. So sometimes you want to back off on the amount of hay, never go below that 1%, but back off. If you're at 2%, go down to 1.5%. 1 and that way you're backing off the calories that are coming from the forage. And even though you want the horse to lose weight, you may be able to maintain the amount of feed, which is providing the fuels that your horse needs to run, especially if, if you're looking for the uh, starch and sugars, you don't wanna back off on the amount of feed enough that your horse then doesn't have the fuel it needs for, for the workload. So kind of look at your total ration and see if you need to 
rely a little bit less on the forage providing the calories and rely a little bit more on the grain. For a typical working horse, it's not at all unusual to look at you know, a 50-50 uh, ratio of grain to hay in the diet for a really hardworking horse. Some of the uh, like thoroughbred race horses can actually, while it's not really recommended to go higher 50-50, some of those thoroughbred racehorses are getting by weight more feed in their diet than they are of hay. Uh, it's, it's probably more typical for a more moderate working horse to get about a 25% feed, 75% forage in the total diet. But again, for, for your particular horse, look at that ratio and see if you need to cut some calories from the forage so that you have room to add the calories and fuel back in the feed portion of the diet. Okay, perfect. And then one last one was, you know, as the season gets going, we're on the road, we're traveling a lot. Um, and then, you know, we return home, the grass is pretty good. We want to be able to turn our horses out, but you know, they're there for short periods. So how do we, you know, prevent overdoing it, you know, when we turn our horses out on that green grass for really short periods of time when we're home in between our events and stuff like that. Man, you guys are asking some really, really good questions. There's, there's, and, and my dog would like to answer that one. Um, there, there are some good things I think you can do as, as yes, of course you want to turn the horses out. Uh, if you, if you can manage the pasture, so it is, it's uh, maybe maybe fence off some areas that you have uh, so that you've got some areas that are somewhat grazed or less lush and use those to start with to let the horse out and run and do some grazing. Minimize the grazing time. You know, I, I, the thought... I completely understand you want to let them get out. You want to let them graze. You want to let them run. But there's also been research that horses that are, uh, their pasture time is minimized. The horses that don't get out on pasture all the time, you turn them out and they put their heads down and mow. And they saw in research that some of these horses in four hours, they can mow enough grass to meet half of their daily calorie requirements. And those are the situations that you're really running, <clears throat> excuse me, running into risks of colic, possibly laminitis. So if that's what your horses are doing, maybe some have, have a dry lot available. Again, it, it depends on the horse. All these, all these feeding management suggestions I will say nine times out of 10, you can break the rules and get away with them, but that 10th time is gonna be devastating. And of course, it's gonna be your best horse. Perhaps a grazing muzzle. Uh, if, if, you've got, if you've got the place, that, you know, you've got structure so you can turn them out, bring them back in for a while, turn them out, bring them back in. I don't know if any of that is feasible, but just, I gotta say, just be aware and try to, minimize the risk as best you can. I know that's not a great answer. I would also say, make sure that you do feed them, give them some hay, give them their feed before you turn them out. So at least there's something in their belly and they're not just going out really hungry and munching down and going to town on the pasture. Hopefully that will help you some. Perfect. Well, I don't see any other questions at this moment. You know, if we missed anyone or you find that you've got questions a little bit later, you can always message, you know, the WPRA page or the Kentucky Equine Research page, and I'm sure we'll get answers for you. Um, there's also a lot of really great information on KER's website, KER.com, uh, and things like that. And we will be posting this video again on our page and Kentucky Equine Research's page. So you can always come back and look at these slides again and find all that information because there was a lot of really, really good information. Um, I think that covers it for today. Do you have anything else you want to add, Dr. Young? Enjoy the spring. Go ride your horses. All righty. Well, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. All right, thank you guys.